I am not a historian, but neither are you. So how about we, the people, learn this stuff together? Welcome to... Can I, can I be honest with you guys about something real quick? This was my original plan. Uh, today's episode, I wanted to talk about prohibition, okay? I want to talk about prohibition, how prohibition became repealed. It's a fascinating topic. I've wanted to get into it ever since I started doing the show. But I am currently uh, taking some classes uh, in school right now to help sort of uh, bolster my uh, my transcript when I uh, when I apply for grad school. It makes me look like, you know, like an overall much better student. I mean, I'm a great student already, but you know what I mean. And one of the classes that I'm taking is a, a world history course, world history from uh, the year 1500 to present day. And uh, recently we had to do our final presentations in class. I just did mine uh, yesterday and mine uh, was on a, a Russian figure, uh, an infamous slash famous uh, man of Russia by the name of Rasputin. I've always found Rasputin to be an incredibly fascinating character, all the myths and legends and everything that surrounds him. So for the past week leading up to my presentation, all I was doing was research on Rasputin, reading the books that I had gotten, going over the books again, uh, going over my notes, making sure my facts were correct. And because I spent all of last week going into Rasputin's life, I didn't really have that much time to dedicate uh, to looking into prohibition, to researching prohibition so I could give you guys a, a fun and yet uh, well-informed episode. So I'm a little upset I can't do the prohibition episode today, I'm not gonna lie to you, but I have done my research on Rasputin. I mean, I know Rasputin has nothing to do with American history, but I, I know a lot about Rasputin now. Maybe, maybe you would like to as well. So maybe guys, just for this week, we we postpone Prohibition and we postpone American history, put it off to the side for just one week, and maybe dive into a, a completely new direction just just this once, huh? You guys, you guys cool with that? Is that okay? You you're you're alright with that? Yeah. All right, huh? Cool. Misha, cue the new intro. Welcome, comrades, to special history episode, debut episode of USSR 101, where today we will dive into glorious story of Russian famous yet infamous monk, religious man, holy man, saint, Sinner, devil, deviant himself, Grigory Efimovich Rasputin. Sorry, sorry about that. I don't, I don't even know why I went into that stereotypical Russian accent for anyone that's from Russia. I apologize if I've offended you in any way. And what is, where did this hat come from? Where did this hat come What the f***? So today, guys, we're talking about Rasputin, the mad monk, the man who is said to be the poison in the ear of Tsar Nicholas II and his wife, Tsarina Alexandra. A man who allegedly had these profound powers of healing, these mystical powers, a man who actually saved the life of the Tsar's son more than once thanks to these alleged mystical healing powers, a man who was said to have actually been the real ruler of Russia. How did this man... Rasputin, go from humble beginnings of a peasant to all powerful. Yeah, it's true guys, Rasputin was not born into power, he was actually born into poverty. He was born on January 21, 1869, in the town of Pokrovskoy in Siberia. And he never received a formal education as a kid. In fact, it said that Rasputin was illiterate up until he became an adult. But when he was a kid, he, uh, he built a reputation for being a bit of a troublemaker and for being a bit of a ladies' man as well. However, in 1886, Rasputin meets Praskovia Dubrovina, and in 1887, at the tender age of 18, he marries her, and then he'll go on to have several children with her. In fact, it's said that he had uh, up to seven children with her, but most of them died, except for three of them who lived into adulthood. Now, very little is known about Rasputin after he gets married and when he's coming up uh, to becoming a young man, but we do know that in 1897, Rasputin will make a pilgrimage to the St. Nicholas Monastery in Siberia. Now, some suggest that he makes his pilgrimage to the monastery because he was actually charged with crimes like stealing horses so he's banished from the town but others suggest that he makes his pilgrimage because it's one that his father wanted to make but he never could so he does it in his father's place but he makes his way to the St. Nicholas Monastery and it is there that he'll meet a man by the name of Macquarie now Macquarie is what's known as a Staretz a Staretz is someone in the Eastern Orthodox Church that is a, a religious teacher an elder and Macquarie takes Rasputin under his wing and starts teaching him everything that he 
knows. And by the time Rasputin leaves the monastery a few months later, he's a completely changed person. He's let his hair grow much longer. His beard is much longer. He's dressing uh, much more modest, like not dressing fine at all. He's wearing rags uh, in some cases. But he's also very well versed in scripture. So much so that he actually offers up his own interpretations of scripture. And at times, he goes off and talks to people about his own views of religion that skew a little bit differently from what the Eastern Orthodox Church is teaching. And when he returns home, he starts building up a following of people that want to hear him preach. And what he does is he builds a small makeshift chapel uh, in his father's house, and that's where people come uh, to worship with Rasputin. Now, it's also suggested that Rasputin may have joined a radical sect of Eastern Orthodoxy known as the Klisti. Now, the Klisti is, uh, is a group of people that get together, and when they get together to worship, they're doing things like singing songs and dancing, but the, 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 the fervor is so fierce during these religious ceremonies that it reaches a point where the energy is so high that everyone just strips naked and starts, you know, having sex with each other. Just huge orgies happening during these uh, during these ceremonies. However, according to historian Joseph Furman, who wrote the book Rasputin, A Life, uh, it's never been proven that Rasputin actually is a member of the Klisti. This is only suggested because uh, prior to some of his ceremonies that he was having with his worshipers, it was said that some women would come and they would bathe Rasputin uh, before he would begin preaching. Now, it's also during this time that Rasputin becomes a wanderer. He's someone that wants to wander throughout Europe and uh, and discover and see holy sites in other places. It's even suggested that he makes it as far as Jerusalem and Greece. And all the while, as he's making his way through Europe, he's uh, he's staying in people's homes. And for staying in people's homes, he offers up religious teaching. And because he's doing this all over the place, word starts to spread about this peasant monk that is uh, talking religion to these people. And by the time he reaches the city of Kazan, he builds a reputation of being a holy man and a healer. And it's also said that Rasputin has uh, quite a few female followers uh, that go to hear him preach. And uh, it's also said that because he's such a deviant, he uh, he proceeds to have sex with a whole lot of them. Rasputin did could not keep it in his pants, that guy. Now, eventually, Rasputin will meet a man known as Fiofan, who is an elder in the Eastern Orthodox Church, and he also has direct ties to Tsar Nicholas II, the Tsarina Alexandra, and the Romanov family. And Fiofan becomes an important figure to Rasputin, as he's going to be the one to basically make the introductions so that Rasputin can get to meet the Tsar in St. Petersburg, which he does in 1905. And when Rasputin meets the Tsar and Alexandra in 1905, he charms the pants off of them. They love this guy by the time they're done meeting with him. And at the same time, when Rasputin comes to the royal court, a lot of these upper class people are enthralled by Rasputin. They love the guy because he's an outsider. He's not one of the, you know, stuffy aristocrats that they're always hanging out with. He's different. Now, by 1906, Rasputin is very well in with the royal family, right? They're cool with him. He's cool with them. But it'll be around this time that he will absolutely cement his place with the royal family thanks to a supposed miracle that he performs on the Tsar's son, Alexei. Now, with all the kids that Nicholas and Alexander have, they only have one son. And that one son is Alexei, which automatically makes him the next heir to the Romanov throne. But here's the problem with Alexei. Alexei is a hemophiliac. He suffers from hemophilia. If you don't know what that is, basically, if you fall down, for example, if you trip and fall, bump your knee, you'll get up, you'll brush it off, and then go about your day. But if you're a hemophiliac, any small bump to the body, any small bruise that you may have could turn into some serious internal bleeding, serious internal hemorrhaging. It, it could be a life and death situation if you're a hemophiliac. And the royal family desperately wanted to keep this a secret because if word got out that the heir to the throne was a hemophiliac and could die just from bumping his head accidentally, it could uh, it could dispute his claim to the throne. And in 1907, Alexei has one of these attacks. He hurts himself and uh, he starts suffering from internal hemorrhaging. And the doctors... Uh, try to heal him, try to cure him. They're doing everything they can according to medicine of the time, early 20th century, uh, but nothing is working. So Alexandra gets desperate. So what she does is she calls to Rasputin, who she knows is supposed to be a healer. She calls to him, please, if there's anything you can do to save my son, please help him. And Rasputin allegedly makes his way to the bedside of Alexei and he prays fervently to God, please, please help this boy, please help this boy. And he's praying and he's sweating so profusely from the from the hard prayers that he's emitting over this boy. A couple days later, Alexei is healing. He's, he's on the road to recovery. And the doctors 
do not know why. Some say that Rasputin hypnotized Alexei. And when you hypnotize somebody, they tend to calm down, they tend to relax, your heart rate starts to slow, which means the blood flow isn't as, isn't as strong in your body. Others say that Alexei was going to naturally recover from this anyway, and Rasputin just happened to show up just as the recovery uh, was about to begin, so it made it look as if like Rasputin actually healed the kid. But regardless of whatever happened, Alexandra is beyond grateful that Rasputin saves her son, and he is in like Flynn with the Empress now. And Rasputin would actually save Alexei again, this time in 1912, but it's an even more miraculous occurrence. In 1912, the Romanov family is off on vacation. Rasputin is back at his home in Siberia, and while they're on vacation, uh, Alexei hurts himself, and again, suffers from internal bleeding, internal hemorrhaging, but this time, it's super bad. It gets to the point where people are almost about ready to, uh, to perform last rites on Alexei, because they think that's it, he's dead. So Alexander sends a telegram to Rasputin, my son is hurt again, please, any Anything you can do, I would sincerely appreciate it. Rasputin gets the telegram while he's at home. He starts praying at home, praying to God, please save the boy, please save the boy. And then at one point, he makes his way back to the telegram office and sends a telegram back to the Empress, which says the following. God has seen your tears and heard your prayers. Do not grieve. The little one will not die. Do not allow the doctors to bother him too much. And it works again. She gets that telegram and Alexei recovers Fully, the doctors don't know why. They don't know what, they, this kid was two seconds away from dying and now one telegram from Rasputin Kid is back to life. So now with Rasputin firmly within the bosom of the royal family, naturally some people are going to start becoming jealous of him and, and they start hating him. For starters, people in the Orthodox Church not really liking the way that Rasputin is preaching the word of God. They say that it's a bit uh, unorthodox, if you will. For example, Rasputin would actually tell people to go ahead and indulge in sin. Go ahead and have all the sex you want. Drink as much as you want, get drunk, stuff your face, do whatever you want, indulge in sin. Because if you don't indulge in sin, how are you supposed to repent? How are you supposed to find God's love and God's mercy? And since the man himself couldn't really keep it in his pants, he was having sex with pretty much anything that moved, my guess is he probably had to come up with some sort of explanation uh, to explain explain his own deviant behavior. Another reason the upper class hated him? Because of his supposed influence over the Tsar and the Tsarina. When World War I begins in 1914, Rasputin is very much against the war, does not want Russia to be involved in World War I, thinks it's a bad idea. But Tsar Nicholas II will eventually head to the front line and take personal command of the Russian army. When he does that, who's left in St. Petersburg? You have the Tsarina, Alexandra, and by her side, Rasputin. Rasputin is going to take full advantage of this. Because it's around this time that certain people in government, certain men of the church, they start losing their positions of power and they're being replaced with people that are called uh, quote-unquote Rasputin men, aka guys that don't have a problem with Rasputin. Meanwhile, the guys that are getting kicked out not big fans of Rasputin to begin with. And Alexandra's starting to make these moves. She's starting to go to Tsar Nicholas and telling him, hey, we should probably get rid of these people and put these people in power instead because Rasputin is going to her and influencing her decision. You know what? I, th this guy might not be the best thing for Russia right now. Might not be the best thing for the church right now. I have someone in mind. Why don't you put this guy in instead? He'll be much better. He'll, he'll do a much better job. So people are starting to think that Rasputin is actually the puppet master behind the Tsar and the Tsarina. And some of them decide that something has to be done about this man. If this man goes away, all will go back to normal. And in 1916, a small group of men get together to form the plot to finally rid the world of Grigory Rasputin. You've got Prince Felix Yusupov, who's a Russian aristocrat. You've got Vladimir Purishkevich, who is a Russian politician. And you've got the Grand Duke Dmitri, who is actually related to the Romanov family. And they decide that this is going to go down on the night of December 16, 1916, at Yusupov's house. What happens is uh, Felix Yusupov invites Rasputin to his house to a party. He says, hey, come by, hang out. We're going to have some drinks, going to have some cakes. It's going to be fun. Come check it out. So Rasputin shows up and the plot begins. Now, Rasputin's death story is probably the most famous thing about Rasputin, and the story that accompanies it was one that Felix Yusupov told and was one that was taken as actual truth for years. To this day, people are still saying that that's the way that Rasputin died. Here's the story. According to Yusupov, what they do is they lay out a bunch of cakes, a bunch of sweets, a bunch of wine, and what they do is they inject all that stuff with poison. They inject it with cyanide, and they say when Rasputin shows up, we're just going to give him these cakes, give him these treats, give him these wines, and a He'll drink them, he'll eat them, he'll die. Simple as that, right? Well, Rasputin shows up to the house. They say, here, have some. He's like, mm, okay, I'll have a couple. He eats a few cakes, drinks some of the wine, and nothing happens. 
He lives. He's, he's still kicking around. He's like, ah, so what else is going on? We going to do something else? So Yusupov starts to freak the f*** out. He's like, Shit. He's not dead. What is, what is, who is this guy? So he runs upstairs to the Grand Duke Dimitri and he says, give me your gun. The poison is not working. I have to shoot this man. Drastic measures have to take place now. So Yusupov comes back with the gun. He takes Rasputin into another room. He wants to show him a crucifix uh, that's in the room. He's like, hey, go ahead and take a look at this crucifix. What do you think? And as Rasputin is looking at the crucifix, uh, Yusupov fires one shot into Rasputin's chest, drops him. Yusupov runs back upstairs thinking, woo, we did it. The devil is dead. Rasputin is gone. The evil scourge over Russia is finally over. Now, when they go back down, to, uh, to collect the body, what happens? Rasputin wakes up. And Yusupov says that he wakes up, his eyes are bugging out of his head, he's foaming at the mouth, he almost attacks Yusupov, moves him out of the way, and starts running out of the palace like a madman. So Purushkevich takes matters into his own hands, he follows Rasputin out into the courtyard of the house and puts two more bullets in him, including one in his head. They then take the body, they tie him up completely, they bind the body in a tarp, and they take it to the river Nevka, and they dump the body in the river, and Rasputin's body is found a few days later, frozen to death. Rasputin finally dead. Fantastic story, but it actually turns out that it's not really all that true. It turns out that when they did an autopsy on Rasputin, there was no water in his lungs, which meant uh, by the time he was thrown in the river, he was already dead. Secondly, they also said that there was no poison uh, inside of his body, which meant he never ate any of the cakes, never drank any of the wine. What killed him was a bullet to the head and the other two bullets that they found in his body. And there you have it, my friends, the story of Rasputin. Hopefully, uh, you guys walk away finding this a bit more interesting. Again, Rasputin's always been a guy that's fascinated me, and uh, I was happy to do this presentation and, and do the research on Rasputin so I could actually learn uh, more about his life. But don't worry, next week we are back on the US 101 tip. Next week we're going to be talking about Prohibition, I promise you, and it's a, a really cool story as well. But thanks to all of you guys that have subscribed to the channel and for liking the videos, sharing them, leaving comments. You guys let me know in the comment section down below your thoughts on, uh, on Rasputin and actually your thoughts on, on this type of episode. Would you like to see um, other histories maybe being talked about on this channel? As always, guys, you can follow US 101 on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, all those links down below in the description box. Guys, I will see you next Tuesday for an all new episode of US 101. So until then, take this off. Ah, there we go. I am all done. And I will see you guys next Tuesday for about prohibition, which means I'm just going to take this with me because uh, it's very important for next week's episode. Nazdrovia, comrades. I'll see you guys when I see you guys. <laughs>